And now we have our amazing state house panel. There are their beautiful pictures. I have some questions for y'all. And then we'll have some moment, some time for y'all to ask questions too. No sad. Awesome. All right, first question. What made y'all want to run for the state house? Uh, Eric, you can go first. Yeah. Um, so I actually didn't want to run for state house. <laughs> um, so Andrew and I started a pack last year, uh, the 2030 Project. Some of you guys, Dylan, work with us. Um, and it's focused on flipping the state legislature before 2030. Um, so the Democrats are in charge before the next redistricting, because when redistricting comes around, they just gerrymander all over again, and we want to take control before that, right? Um, so we were very involved in state politics and following the issues and trying to identify flippable districts around the state that we could focus resources on. Um, and so, you know, in conjunction with that, we were also looking for people to run for these seats right here, you know, 120, 121. Uh, we came actually to UGA Dens last spring looking for maybe someone who's going to graduate soon and might want to run for office. Um, Try to find somebody else to do it, but we had a hard time. It, it's tough to find somebody to run for a job to pay $17,000 a year. Um, so March came around. We actually did find someone to run for my seat. Her name was Courtney Frisch. She qualified in March. We didn't find anyone in 121. Andrew stepped up for that one. Um, and so Courtney had to withdraw. Her employer insisted she withdraw. But since she withdrew after the primary, it gave us one weekend basically to find a replacement, and that ended up being me. Um, and the reason I stepped up, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's hard. I've, I've got a full time job, I've got a small business. Um, you know, if I manage to win this race, I'm going to be about a year and a half into a three year work contract, so I'm going to have some issues to work through. Um, but I, when I thought about it, you know, looking at the excitement this year and what's going on and what's at stake for Georgia, it was worth taking that chance, right? So if, I, if and when I win this race, I'll cross that bridge when I get to work and have to figure it out from there. Um, because the, these are, I mean, like I said, Andrew and I have been looking at districts all over the state. These aren't the easiest to flip, but they are possible to flip. And so it was too important, couldn't let it go on challenge. Um, so I decided to run for uh, state representative because lack of representation in District 124. Um, right now, my incumbent is uh, Republican. He's been in the seat since 2015. He was appointed to that seat. Um, and he really hasn't had any opposition to run against him until now. Um, and I just wanted to see, I wanted representation for Democrats. I mean, Green County has all Republican County Commissioners, um, so lack of representation there. The Board of Education has only one Democrat on it, lack of, rep, rep, you know, representation there. So I pretty much wanted to just try to get in. Have a seat at the table, try to make some uh, decisions, correct some things, just have a voice. And I want to be able to make sure other people have a voice. So that's why I decided to run. Now, Green County <laughs> is a red county. But I'm from there, so a lot of people already know me because I'm a community leader. So I, I, I go to all the county commissioners meetings, I go to all the city council meetings, the board of education meetings, the board of elections meetings, they always see me. So I think that right there for Green County is kind of giving me an edge, so to speak, because they see me in the community doing things. Um, also, <laughs> Roe versus Wade, persuaded me of a lot, because I'm a woman. And I have three grown daughters, and I have granddaughters. And I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> this is not gonna work. So, uh, you know, like I said, I wanna have a seat at the table. 
I want to, I want to be able to tell my grandchildren, look, you don't have to uh, just, just follow instructions. You don't have to do that when it comes to your body. Nobody can tell you what to do with your body. So that's pretty much the main part. I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> Not when it comes to my body. So um, that was pretty much a decision, just representation. We all need it. We all should have a voice. And that's what I want. Um, I, I think most of y'all know me. Uh, for those who don't, Andrew Ferguson running for State House 120 against Republican Houston Gaines, who was the deciding yes vote on Georgia's original six week abortion ban. Um, if that wasn't reason enough, um, he's also voted guns on campus. He's also driven anti immigrant legislation. Um, every issue you could imagine, this guy's on the wrong side of it. Um, Georgia. Um, on all of these issues, as a state, it's probably 70 plus percent. Um, and so it, you know, as Eric said, we did really try because we already had the 2030 project to find other people. But when it became clear that no one else really wanted to do this, um, I was certainly motivated to do this um, for the people of District 120, um, understanding how gerrymandered, not just the state of Georgia is, but how Athens is so gerrymandered. We're the smallest county in the entire state of Georgia. We are, yeah, as the map shows, um, we are the most gerrymandered county in the state. Um, this map shows just the state house. We really should, by right, have three um, Democrats, not just Spencer and the state house. Um, we have a split with our state senate seat where we've got two Republicans because you split Athens right in half, we really should have a Democratic state senator that represents Athens. Um, we'll probably get to in a little bit, Eric's one of his big issues and one of mine is gerrymandering, so I don't want to dive too deep into that right now. Um, but in terms of running for public office, um, my late father was a Gwinnett County Commissioner. Uh, he was a Republican and he served back in the 80s and early 90s helped lay the foundation for a lot of what Gwinnett is today. So I saw the power of public service as a child, and that was very impactful. The rest of my family is in public education, and I have seen over the last 20 years how the Republican-controlled state legislature has really not served public education well. Uh, and so that's also part of my motivation. We are working off a funding formula from 1985, all right? Democrats, every session, propose legislation to try and move Georgia forward. Republicans stand in the way of progress. Republicans, like my opponent, Houston Gaines, stand in the way of progress. And this session, they went as far as to pass a private school voucher scam bill. That, as we were talking about Arizona before the official meeting started, um, and in several other states, we have seen what this private school voucher bill does to states. It steals money from public education. It makes public outcomes worse for public education students. Um, and it just makes everyone's life harder. Meanwhile, you have private businesses that pop up, set up these schools, and drain money out of the public coffers. So we've got to fight back against that. The way we fight back is to get in the majority in at least one of these two houses and the state house is much more doable by the maps, despite this map here in Athens. So we've got to run for these. We've got to make sure the people here in Athens and the greater Athens area know that if you run, there will be support. If you run, you can flip these seats. Um, when we don't run candidates, as we have over 50 state legislature seats, unopposed this cycle. You get democracy deserts, and that just doesn't just hurt the down ballot folks and the local people, it hurts the top of the ticket. And folks like Kamala Harris, Tim Walz, um, in future years, it'll hurt people like Senator Ossoff. So we've got to run people, we've got to run strong campaigns. Um, those are some of the many reasons I could go on all night. I'll stop there. <laughs> I think that Andrew foreshadowed my next question. Some. 
If elected, what's y'all's number one priority? Uh, we'll go back to Andrew <laughs> as I catch my breath. Um, re uh, repealing the six-week abortion ban, number one priority. Um, obviously, that is a tremendous wrong that has been overturned, uh, or that has that Republicans worked and former convicted felon Donald Trump worked to get a Supreme Court that would overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, they did that. In Georgia, we already had the six-week abortion ban. Um, so one of two things needs to happen, ideally both. Uh, we need to take control of the state legislature, repeal that abortion ban, or we need to take control of the White House, and it's a longer path to get the Supreme Court reformed because we have a corrupt Supreme Court right now. Um, so that's a much longer process. The shorter process for reproductive rights here in Georgia is to control the state legislature. Um, we can do that on a much shorter time frame, so that would be my number one legislative priority. Well, that would be my number one priority. Also, <laughs> um, and he pretty much summed it up, so I'm going to go to my number two. How about it? Perfect. <laughs> Common sense gun laws. That's my next part. Um, I'm a veteran, uh, and it, it really irritates me that we have permitless gun care. As a veteran, being in the military, I was trained to use a weapon. I was trained, which means that I didn't just go pick out a gun. I'm sorry, weapon. We have to come with I didn't just go pick out a weapon and say, oh, this is pretty. I'm going to walk around with it. I had to be able to learn how to use it, how to clean it, how to put it, take it loose, put it back together. That took time. And, and the fact that anybody in that has common sense would say, why not just give everybody a weapon? Just, just, just let them go out there and purchase one. No training, no safety uh, precautions in place. It's crazy to me. And every day, a child is killed by a weapon. It's like, Pretty much every 47 seconds, a child is shot by a weapon. So that's that's one of the issues. I want to put some type of uh, safety precautions, training. I mean, when you try to drive a car, you, before you can actually drive legally, you have to have a permit, a license. We should be putting stuff like that in place. It, it shouldn't be that if we can just go out and just drive, right? I mean, it makes no sense. If we have a license to drive a car, why wouldn't we have license and permits to carry a weapon? If we have to get a permit prior to driving a car, getting real license, why can't we do the same with guns? People care more about guns than they do about women rights. It's, it's common sense should be there, and that's what I'm. I, one of the things I'm going to focus on: common sense. Um, yeah. So it, it's kind of hard to narrow down to just one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I'm when I'm out giving my stump speech, I, I kind of come to, to three issues that I, I call out, but there are a lot more than that. Um, number one is uh, expanding Medicaid. You know, Georgia's one of the nine states that hasn't expanded Medicaid. And, and you see the results in, you know, there's an article in Forbes magazine last year, they ranked Georgia 50th, last in the nation, in terms of healthcare outcomes. So that's looking at the cost of, of healthcare, access to healthcare, um, all of these things, you know, we, we've had, uh, I forget the exact number, it was like 12 rural hospitals have closed in the last 10 years, something like that. Yep. Um, and that just makes access even worse. So that that's why we're sitting at 50 
And a big reason is because we have not expanded Medicaid. Um, so that that's one, number one. Number two, I was talking about is the abortion ban. Um, you know, just this week, ProPublica, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but they published two articles this week, one this morning, too, about two different women that went into great detail about these preventable deaths. These women died because they, they had access to medical care, but they were afraid, like, doctors were afraid to get it. One of them actually didn't go to the hospital because she didn't think she could get assistance. Um, but there were ruled preventable deaths, and we're going to see a lot more of those coming through now because there's a there's a group, um, there's like a task force or review board or something that is reviewing maternal mortality because Georgia's one of the worst in the nation, yes. especially if you're a woman of color. Yes. Um, and and so they're reviewing these things, but they run about two years behind. So right now they're starting to see cases from people who died two years ago, right after that abortion, they went into effect. Um, so that's huge. And and one thing I, I always like to point out when I'm talking about this to people is. You know, you may have heard that places like Kansas, Michigan, and I think Ohio, they all have ballot initiatives to protect access to abortion. And people wonder why we haven't done that here in Georgia. Anybody know that answer? We can. <laughs> we can, right. Georgia's state legislature, the only way to get a, a ballot initiative on the ballot is to pass the Georgia state legislature. And you think the Republicans that passed that law are going to pass a, an amendment to protect abortion? No. Right? So that's number two. And number three, um, the one that I, I is kind of near and dear to me, because I think it's kind of the, the grandfather of them all, the key to, to fixing everything is is voting in elections, right? Um, I am a big favor, I want to repeal the, the state election board changes they made recently. Um, I think that needs to go. I want to implement independent redistricting commissions. I think if we have more competitive districts around the state, you won't get extremist candidates. Um, if you do get extremist candidates, they're unlikely to win in a competitive district, so you, you'll get better legislators and better laws out of it. Um, and the other thing is ranked choice voting. I think that that gives more people, uh, you know, more opinions in the marketplace, and it can really become a more competitive marketplace of ideas um, that can really push us forward. Sorry, I'll <laughs> <laughs> take the three. So recently there was the shooting at Appalachian High School and then the two women who died because of Georgia's abortion ban. As Melanie said, these laws go against common sense. So how do we return common sense to the General Assembly? And you can talk about how y'all's opponents like common sense or how you would work with people across the aisle to try and find common ground on the common sense issues. Yeah, we'll start with you, Eric. <laughs> okay. Um, that was like a pattern. <laughs> yeah, back and forth, back and forth. Um, yeah, how, how do you get the... How many in here, how many people in here are younger than 20 years old? Yeah. The Georgia legislature and the state government, the state government, the state house, state senate, and the governor's mansion have been in control of your entire life, right? They've been controlled by the Republicans your entire life. So, so how do you talk sense with people who've been in control that long? I don't know. That, that's the million dollar question. Um, I mean, I think it would. I hope that. Well, I'll say this: like the Appalachian shooting happened a couple of weeks ago. We've heard, you know, little bitty bits of movement on the Republican side. Like the Republican Speaker of the House has talked about being open to, I forget the specific issue, the specific uh, the safe safe storage. Storage. Pediatric, pediatric, pediatric safe storage. Yeah, pediatric safe storage. So, I mean, that, that's something. They weren't even willing to talk about that a year ago, right? Um, I hate that it takes a shooting to bring it to the table, but that's a start. And I don't know if we can get back to restoring uh, concealed carry permits, right? We're probably a long way from there until we take over the legislature. Um, but I do think, I think one place, so going back to the, the, my thought that that um, competitive districts is a way to fix a lot of things, right? I think you have more competitive districts and you get you know, reasonable, more reasonable people in those positions, then you can get back to common sense. And I think there is a limit there because the demographics in the state are changing, right? 
gerrymandering can can hold it off for so long that at some point they're going to lose power. So I think there's a window there where Republicans are starting to realize that they're going to lose power. They may be more on board with something like independent redistricting commissions rather than have Democrats gerrymander everything the other way. So, and and yeah, I'm running as a Democrat. I am a Democrat. But I would love to see independent redistricting commissions. I don't want the Democrats to gerrymander the other way any more than I want the Republicans to have a gerrymander right now. So I think longer term, yeah, you know, it's definitely longer term, but I think that's the only way I can see to actually make that happen. Oh, okay, well, um, get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <Not> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would. As far as the abortion ban, I would have to come at it in a personal perspective. Um, I mean, of course, women, we, 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 we get it. We understand, you know, we don't want anybody telling us what to do with our body. But there's a large percentage of men Republicans. But those men Republicans, they have daughters. They have wives. They have friends of women who are friends. And I would just, you know, listen. Would you want your daughter in this position where if something happened to her, if she got raped, let's just say raped, and she, you know, that's, that's horrific. Would you want to have to go somewhere else? And I know that they have, you know, the restrictions. Okay, I get that. But would you want to have to take her somewhere else out of this state just to get an abortion? Or what if your wife, who is over 40, She's pregnant, and you find out that she can't carry the baby full term. And if she does try to carry the baby full term, then there could be implications where, or complications, where she may die. What are you going to do? I mean, are you going to let your wife go through with the pregnancy knowing that she may die? It's just... Think about, think about it on a personal level. That's probably what I would say. Let's just think about it on a personal level. You wouldn't want your daughter, you wouldn't want your nieces, you wouldn't want your wives to go through um, anything like that. That's, it's human rights. It's just simple as that. When it comes to human rights, there is no red, blue, there's no Democrat, Republican, Independent. It's just human rights. And that's, that's probably the way I have to just come, come in it that way. Because in another way, they probably won't listen. I mean, I think that Republicans, and I'm just going to put this out here, it's a game. That's, they look at life as a game. And checkers and chess. If I do this, let's see what happens. If I do this, let's see what happens. And it's crazy. So they hold our lives in their hands as a game. And, and when, I'm tired of the games. I'm, seriously, I am sick and tired of the games. This is life. At the end of the day, we have to make smart, common sense choices about our lives. So that's probably how I, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think there's probably for me um, an A and a B to this specific question. Um, a, in terms of the shooting at Appalachia, um, I think most of y'all probably know there is a statewide walkout scheduled for Friday. Um, Gwinnett has a digital day, so there's going to be a rally in Gwinnett at 1230 in J.B. Williams Park. Um, so one thing we can do is make our voices heard. 
Um, the more we show up, the more we can push, even with gerrymandered maps, these Republicans more towards the middle, more towards the middle are where the solutions are. Um, so we've got to show up. Um, it's horrendous that it takes tragedies for Republicans to move on any of these issues. Um, but as Democrats, we've got to fight all the time. And when something tragic, like two, st two students and two teachers are killed, um, clearly in an instance when this could have been prevented, um, we've got to make our voices heard and we've got to show up. Um, otherwise, they're just gonna keep rolling because they don't care. Um, and, and that's the sad truth. Um, they are saying a lot of stuff right now because it's election season and they need to get elected. Um, if they get elected, they're not going to entertain any of this stuff once they have control again for another two years. Um, that's just the harsh reality of it. Um, which brings us to point two and touch on what Christian was mentioning earlier. Um, canvassing for Laura. Um, Democrats have got to start winning more elections in the state of Georgia. Um, that is where we are with the state legislature. The Republicans are not gonna move on guns, they're not gonna move on reproductive rights. We've got to move the legislature. Um, so canvassing for candidates like Laura, um, candidates like um, Michelle Kang, um, candidates like Ashwin Ramaswamy, uh, we've got to take the seats when we can take the seats. I'll go back to 2020. Um, we went blue Biden-Harris, we went blue Ossoff Warnock. The State House Caucus designated 17 seats for flipping in that cycle. Does anyone know, if you haven't heard me say this before, does anyone know how many of those 17 did we flip? The two? We got one of them. All right, so to Christian's point, when we can flip seats, and this is a favorable environment for Democrats, Republicans are not, fingers crossed, gonna always run a convicted felon at the top of the ticket. We've got to make the most of them doing so. We've got to make them pay for running a horrible candidate and a horrible vice presidential candidate in the state of Georgia in a year when Brian Kemp isn't on the ballot. We've got to win as many seats as possible. Um, so to your point, or your question, Jay, how do we work with people? We win more seats, and they'll be much more willing to work with us. So why are y'all voting for Kamala Harris, and what can we as UGA students do to help get her elected and y'all elected? I guess it's back to me. Yeah, back to you. yeah, I mean, for all the reasons, right? I mean, first of all, she, she comes at this work with such joy and compassion and expertise. All right. She is part of this Biden-Harris administration that has accomplished a tremendous amount in this last, you know, almost four years. Um, so she has the experience. She's also not Donald Trump, who wants to be dictator on day one. Um, she understands freedom, whether that's freedom from an overreaching government telling a woman what they can and can't do with their body, or whether that's freedom from an overreaching government telling everyone you can have a gun and there are no rules. Um, she is the leader we need in this moment and she has such joy uh, for the work. Um, there's a million reasons I could go on and on why I'm personally voting for her, um, but she is the right person at the right time for the right job and I think the country has seen a lot of themselves in her and in Governor Walls, um, and they see the humanity, and they see the compassion, and they see wanting to solve problems and make people's lives better. That's why we're all so drawn to both of them, because we see the best in ourselves in them, and we see that best for our country. Um, what can we do at the same time to elect um, Kamala and Waltz at the top of the ticket while electing us. Um, I think y'all are already doing a lot of things, so I, I don't know that I have um, anything to say. Um, the coordinated office is doing a fantastic job. Y'all are here tonight. Thank you so much. 
um, the campus organizer, Ethan, also doing a fantastic job. The young Nick from UGA. Yeah. Um, the young dudes of UGA. Y'all are doing a fantastic job. Show up. So much energy, so much creative um, social media content that reaches a lot more people than just like your peer group. It reaches people that are my age, that are Eric's age, that are Mel's age, and older. I mean, I, I'll go to like an Indivisible event and they'll talk about following y'all mm -hmm. on social media and being like inspired and be like, we love these young people here in Athens. It was like retired people too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Indivisible 10, if you don't know yet, they're retired yeah. folks. Um, and they do great work too, I want to make sure to mention that. Um, they're always out there, um, even in non-election years. Um, but I, I think we're all working as hard as we can. I think the, the main thing, and Eric and I talk about this on our coordinated campaign, is making sure we're talking about uh, how many times are we knocking this person's door, all right? And no one's gonna not vote because we knocked their door like seven times, but we are gonna not use the resources as efficiently if we aren't communicating enough. Um, so I think, you know, we're gonna do that going forward, but y'all are doing a great job uh, already uh, at the tail end of your question, so that'd be my answer. Oh, okay, so why am I voting for Kamala? Um, because she is smart, intelligent, and she has a plan. She, she knows what it's going to take in order for us to get democracy back where it should be. Um, she is motivating a lot of people. Um, it definitely was a turn when she decided, well, when President Biden decided to step down and allow her to run for president, the energy went through the roof. People who were undecided, all of a sudden got excited. They wanted to come out and volunteer. They wanted to, um, whatever it takes, they wanted to move around and do stuff and, and try to go see her in Atlanta in the rain. And it, it was just motivation. And like Andrew said, a lot of people saw themselves in her. So it's, it's She's making history. I, me personally, I am just like, I thought I'd never see the day. I thought, and not in my lifetime, would I ever see a woman running for president of the United States of America and has the opportunity to win because she's going to win. She's going to win. Uh, so it's just history. It's, 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 it's amazing. And she wants to do the right thing. She's compassionate. Um, well, it's a lot I can say about her. But one thing I will say is that I know that if, when she does get in that White House, it's going to be beneficial for every one of us. Not just a handful, not just a certain group. It's going to be for everyone. And that's what we need. We, once again, let me go back to the same common sense. We need somebody up there with common sense. So, and that's what we'll be getting. Um, as far as I'm with Andrew. You all are doing it. Everything that needs to be done, you all are doing it. From coordinating with uh, the campaign, from helping us on the local level, and oh, and I will say this the local level is extremely important. Local elections. They are by far the most important elections because your local elections are di they directly affect you directly when you live in and you helping us 
get in those seats. You have a direct line. Direct line. Direct communication. You reach out and touch us like this. <laughs> you know, freak out. So, it's extremely important. And you all are the future. You're it. I've always, I always say, a true leader, a true leader always mentors their replacement. A true leader does, I don't want to be sitting in the House of Representatives all for the rest of my years here on this earth. That's not me. I want to take someone up under me, show them how to do my job, so that I could sit back and retire and just <laughs> look, look, look. That's what I want to do. I, I don't want to be sitting in the House of Representatives for 10 years. I want somebody up under me watching me move and, I mean, doing my job. I want somebody to replace me who has the same, uh, um, What's the word? The same commitment, commitment passion, ideology, values. values that I do. So, and that's, that's y'all. So, in two years, if we have a, a, a spot that needs to be filled, guess where we come? Here, because you are the ones who's going to fill that spot. That's what we want to see. We want You are the future. But that's what I want to say. Hey, that's <laughs> it. And the U.S. citizen. Yeah. That's it. And you're it. All right. Um, so why am I voting for Kamala? Um, she's not a convicted felon. <laughs> uh, she's never tried to overturn an election that I'm aware of. Um, she doesn't lie every time she opens her mouth. Um, yeah, the, the bar's pretty low, honestly, right? I mean, she's the only reasonable choice in the race. But, I mean, she deserves it on her own, right? I mean, she she's super qualified. You know, DA in, in San Francisco, Attorney General for California, Senator for California, Vice President. I don't know if we've ever had a more qualified candidate for the position. Um, you know, when she speaks, she speaks about, you know, an opportunity economy and how that's going to help everyone. Um, and that's inspiring, right? And, and to be frank, I think it's long past time to have a woman in the White House. Um, Yay! Yeah. She's 248 years old. I remember that little lesson in the 248 year old country, it's always been run by predominantly white men, one exception. Um, and we see where we've gotten. I, I think a woman can, can really push it to the next level, um, and especially in this environment. I mean, with the energy and everything, I just feel so optimistic when I think about her in the White House. Um, so that would be why, as far as what you guys can do, um, I mean, there are some tactical things, right? And you guys in this room, y'all are doing it, right? You're canvassing, you're talking to your friends. Um, do that as much as you can, get the word out, especially when it comes to local issues, right? You probably have friends that don't realize that it's up to Atlanta about you know abortion access. You know, it's up to Atlanta about what we're going to do about guns, right? If DC, you know, maybe they can do something too, but we can do it a lot faster in Atlanta by the right people there. So it's important to talk to your friends about how important state level elections are. Um, I don't think there are any local elections in November. Those were all in Platt County. Those were all nonpartisan back in May, I think. Right. So. so in Clark County, you know, it's, it's the federal, you know, you've got Congress, you've got the, you know, obviously the president, and then you've got the state legislature, right? And so many people, and I used to be one of them, would go into that voting booth and see those names for the first time and say, I, I don't know, right? So you guys have all heard from us, so tell people if they're registered here, vote for us, right? Um, that's super important. Uh, the other thing I would say, too, is... Um, so I, I was a delegate to Chicago with uh, Christian here, um, which was an amazing experience getting to see Kamala Harris and all those speakers. But one of the sessions I went to, 
the Arizona Secretary, Secretary of State, I forget his name, um, but his big message to everyone was, if you're waiting until election day to vote, you are wasting campaign resources. And, and that kind of struck me, right? Because it's true, if you've worked on the campaign, you know once early voting starts, every day there's a data feed update and you can see if somebody has voted. And if they voted, you're not calling them anymore. You're not knocking on their door. You can focus on people who haven't turned out yet. So get that message out too, right? Vote for state legislature, it's super important, and vote as early as you possibly can. So the campaigns can focus resources on people who haven't voted and turn out those votes too. And that's how I think it gives us a good shot at winning, but it also helps the top of the table. And y'all can stand that to help out with Eric's campaign. Can we give a round of applause for them for coming?